Um, in the last lecture, we uh, motivated the study of random graph models. We introduced the Edish Renyi random graph, uh, and we also posed some of the questions that we'd like to look at. Uh, so this time we are going to uh, look at one of those in more detail. So this is uh, the question about whether a given subgraph or motif appears within the random graph G and P. And to keep things concrete, we are going to look at the case of triangles. Uh, so let me share screen and continue. Okay, so we are looking at uh, G, N, P, N, the edge pr probability. Okay, let me remind you of the random graph model. There are N vertices. Uh, an edge is present between each pair of vertices with probability P, which may depend on N. Uh, and this is independent of whether any other edges are present or absent. So each edge is present independent of the others. And the probability of the edge being present may depend in some way with N. Uh, and we are interested in N large N. So more concretely, we are going to let consider a sequence of such random graphs uh, and let N tend to infinity. Okay, and we are going to look at P scaling in a certain way with N. Uh, and the question that we are going to address this time is the following, does G and P contain triangles? Okay, and more precisely, uh, we want to calculate uh, the probability that it does so. Uh, exact calculations of this probability will be uh, difficult, so we are going to get some easy upper and lower bounds on this probability. Um, okay. Uh, it turns out that the, okay, I, I mentioned that PN, okay, we'll come to that in a moment. Right, so we want to calculate this probability. We'll first look at upper bounds. And we are going to compute an upper bound uh, by calculating the expected number of triangles and using Markov's inequality. So the approach is um, calculate the expected number of triangles in GNP. GNP is a random graph and the expected number of triangles is a random variable. And then we use Markov's inequality to bound the probability that there's at least one triangle. So if we studied this while studying rumor spreading, so if you've forgotten, now's a good time to remind yourself of Markov's inequality. Okay, first, how do we calculate the expected number of triangles? So let's pick three vertices, i, j, and k from the vertex set. Uh, 
and we are going to denote by chi subscripted by ijk the indicator random variable which I'll denote by one one uh, the indicator that uh, there is a triangle on these three vertices. in this random graph. Okay, so what's an indicator random variable? So this is the random variable that takes the value of one if there is such a triangle and it takes the value zero, uh, there isn't a triangle. on these three vertices. Okay, that's the definition. Maybe a picture helps. So we have a lot of vertices. And then here are the three vertices. We pick I, J and K and the edge between every pair of them is present independent of the others. So maybe this edge is present. This. Maybe these are the edges that are present in the graph. And now you can see there's no triangle in this picture. There's no triangle on these three vertices because there's no direct edge between I and K. Okay, so depending on the realization of this random graph, there may or may not be a triangle. And so this indicator random variable may take the value one or the value zero. So that's the definition of this indicator. Uh, which I'll rewrite, so I have to clear this. Okay, so once more, chi ijk is the indicator that um, there is a triangle on vertices ijk. in the random graph GNP, but I won't write that since that's common all the time. And let's define one more random variable. Let's define the number of triangles to be the sum over all possible unordered triplets IJK of vertices of chi ijk of this indicator. Okay, and so this set here ijk, so we are thinking of this as a set, so the order doesn't matter. So this is unordered triplets of vertices. Okay, so we pick three vertices from the vertex set and ask in this random graph, this, we, we have put down a random collection of edges, is there, is, are all three of these edges, i, j, j, k, and k, i present in this random graph? Uh, and then we do this for every possible triplet of vertices and add up all the indicators and clearly that's counting the total number of triangles in the graph, in the random graph. Okay, so n triangle is the number of triangles in GNP. Okay, and P depends on n. 
So first let's calculate the expectation of this random variable. So the expected number of triangles is the expectation of the sum over triplets. of the indicator that there's a triangle on these three vertices. And so this is the sum over triplets of the expectation of this indicator. And why is this true? This is just linearity of expectation. It doesn't require any independence. So this is just linearity of expectation. Okay, so we first want to uh, calculate this expectation and then evaluate the sum. So let's do that next. the formula we are going to use. The expected number of triangles is the sum over triplets. Of the expectation of this indicator random variable chi i j k. Uh, but now what's the expectation of an indicator random variable? An indicator takes only values zero or one. So the expectation is just the probability that it takes the value one. So this random variable takes the value one if the triangle is present. So this is the probability of the event of which it's an indicator. So this is the probability that there is a triangle on IJK. Now, if we fix three vertices, what's the probability that there's a triangle on them? Uh, for the triangle to be present, all three edges between pairs of vertices have to be present. So there, there should be an edge between i and j, one between i and k, and one between j and k. Uh, and so the probability that all those three edges are present is just p cubed, okay, and p depends on n. Uh, and this is because the edges are independent by definition of an additional random graph. Okay, so that's the probability of any of these indicators. It's the same no matter which three vertices you pick. It's P cubed. And so what's the expected number of triangles? So the expected number of triangles is the sum of this constant P cubed over all triplets of vertices. So it's the same number every time. So it's just uh, P cubed times the number of such triplets. And how many such triplets are there? So how many ways can we choose three vert vertices out of N? Uh, that's just and choose three. Okay, so this is n choose three times p n cubed. Okay, so let me write this down exactly once, but in future we'll be pretty sloppy. So this is n n minus one n minus two over one times two times three, which is six times p n cubed. 
Okay, n is large. We don't care about the difference between n, uh, n, n, n minus one and n minus two are all roughly the same. So this is approximately uh, one sixth of n cubed p cubed. And okay, for much of this section of the course, we are going to be even sloppier. We won't even care about constants, so I'm just going to say this is roughly n cubed, p cubed. Okay, we'll even ignore the one sixth because this is some constant which doesn't go to zero or infinity as n tends to infinity. Okay, so it's going to be good enough for us to do such quite sloppy calculations. And you'll see soon why uh, we can afford to be so sloppy. Okay, so this is the expected number of triangles. This is how it depends on P n. Uh, now we are going to consider a particular scaling regime for these probabilities. It turns out, so I mentioned in passing last time that if you plot uh, the edge probability P against the probability of seeing a specific subgraph, say a triangle, then for large n, this shows a typical behavior which shows a sharp transition from values close to zero, to, from probabilities close to zero to probabilities close to one. Uh, and this happens not at some constant value of the probability like 0.3, but it happens in some suitable scaling. And that's what we are going to look at next. So we are going to pick a suitable scaling regime for these edge probabilities uh, where we will see such a sharp transition. Okay, so let me rewrite what we had last time. So we had on the last page, so we had the expected number of triangles is approximately n cubed, p cubed. Okay, and we are going to consider the scaling regime. Where the edge probability Pn scales as uh, n to the minus alpha for some alpha positive. Okay. Uh, so the, as the number of edges increases, sorry, as the number of vertices increases, um, the probability of any particular edge being present decreases uh, like some fractional power of n, like n to the minus alpha. Uh, the degree of a vertex, which is n times p or n minus one times p, grows roughly like n to the one minus alpha. So depending on whether alpha is bigger than one or smaller than one, the degree could be large, but the probability of any particular edge being present is small. Okay, so that's the scaling regime we are considering. And why this particular regime? Well, because this is the one at which it exhibits, this is the one which exhibits the sharp transition we spoke about. So somehow this is where the interesting behavior happens. Okay, so if we consider the scaling regime, then the expected number of triangles, just plugging in, is up to some constants, this is 
m cubed times m to the minus three alpha, which is n to the three times one minus alpha. And how does this behave? So the expected number of triangles goes to zero as n tends to infinity if alpha is bigger than one. Okay, if alpha is bigger than one, uh, the exponent here is negative. So it's n raised to some negative power and that tends to zero as n goes to infinity. And if alpha is smaller than one, uh, then this is a positive power. So this goes to n raised to a positive power. So this goes to infinity. Okay, and we are not going to be interested in what happens when alpha is exactly one. There it goes to some constant, which we ignored. And we ignored because we don't, we are not going to look at exactly what happens at the critical value, but only above or below that. And there it either goes to zero or goes to infinity, irrespective of what the value of the constant in front was, the constant that we ignored. Okay, so this is the expected number of triangles. And intuitively, what do we expect? So, uh, so, so does the random graph contain a triangle or not? So intuitively, we expect based on the expected values, the probability that GNP contains a triangle goes to zero if alpha is bigger than one. If the expected number of tri triangles is zero, we, it's reasonable to think that there should be no triangles. Uh, and if the expected number of triangles is very big, then the probability of having a triangle should go to one. So this is a reasonable thing to expect. And is this true? Can we prove this? Okay, so. Is this true and can we prove it? Okay, so uh, it turns out that one of these things is easy. The first line is easy uh, and the second one's harder. So let me rewrite what we had for the expectation. So we have Pn, we are looking at the scaling regime, Pn is n to the minus alpha. And in this case, the expected number of triangles and the additional random graph is up to some constant, it's n to the three minus three alpha. Okay, so uh, what does this tell us about the probability that GNP contains a triangle. So what's the probability that the number of triangles in the random graph is at least one? This is what it means for the random graph to contain a triangle. Uh, so the probability that this random variable n delta is at least one is bounded above by the expected number of triangles divided by one. And this follows by Markov's inequality because the number of triangles is a non-negative random variable. And for any non-negative random variable X, the probability that it's bigger than some constant C is bounded by the mean of X over C. 
Okay, and so this is approximately n to the three minus three alpha. And so this goes to zero as n goes to infinity if alpha bigger than one. Okay, so we can conclude that if alpha is bigger than one, um, then uh, the probability that G and B contains a triangle, at least one triangle, which is the same as the event we wrote above, goes to zero. And uh, just some, some more terminology, we say that an event More precisely, a sequence of events, one defined uh, on each of these graphs, G and P. But here, intuitively, we are thinking of the event as contains triangles, but we have to, there's one such event for every N. And we say that an event occurs with high probability and we'll abbreviate that WHP uh, if the probability of the event or the nth event in the sequence uh, tends to one as n tends to infinity. Okay, so this can happen arbitrarily slowly. So even for n equals a thousand, the probability may only be 0 0.001. At n equals a million, it may be 0 0.002. Uh, but so long as it increases to one as n goes to infinity, we say it occurs with high probability. In practical terms, that may not, for the n you are interested in, that probability may still be pretty small, but it's an asymptotic statement. Okay, and so this is just some terminology. So this is what the phrase with high probability means. I should also mention that different people use slightly different terminology here. So what we call with high probability is also called asymp um, asymptotically almost surely. Uh, and there may be other names for it. And some, especially in theoretical computer science, the phrase with high probability is used only if the probability of the complement decays to zero fast enough like n to some minus a fractional power, but we are not going to, uh, uh, we, we are going to use it just to mean that the probability of the complement decays to zero, however slowly it may be, and the probability of the event itself increases to one. Okay, so, uh, so in terms of this definition uh, or terminology, uh, we can say that um, okay, I'm not sure if the bottom of the screen is visible, so I'll just say. Um, so in in this terminology, the probability that the random graph G and P contains no triangles holds with high probability if alpha is bigger than one. The random graph is triangle free with high probability if alpha is bigger than one. Okay, so that that deals with the case alpha is bigger than one. So what happens if alpha is smaller than one? So 
so if I if I smaller than one, then uh, the expected number of triangles uh, tends to infinity, as n tends to infinity. So the graph, on average, the random graph has lots and lots of triangles. So with high probability, there must be at least one, right? That seems perfectly reasonable and intuitive. Uh, okay, but that's not so obvious. It is true for triangles, but it's not always true. And uh, it does need a proof. And to show you that things can go wrong, we are going to look at the, a counter example involving a different graph. So the graph I'm going to look at is the following. So there will be a square with one of its diagonals present. And then there will be this dangling hook. So here is, so it's not a triangle, it's something else. Let's denote this by H. So H is going to be this graph on five vertices We'll denote the number of vertices in H by V sub H. So H has five vertices and you can count the edges. It has uh, four for the square five and then six. So it has six edges. And then we are also going to consider this subgraph H prime consisting of just the square with its diagonal. So let's get rid of the hook. And this is H prime. And it has four vertices and five edges. OK, and now what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the number of uh, copies of H that are present uh, in the random graph and the number of copies of H prime that are present in the random graph, expected number of copies. So let's do those calculations. So take a moment to make sure you uh, remember the figures H and H prime uh, because I'm going to erase this in a moment to do the calculations. Okay, so let's define indicators for each of them. So I'm going to define chi h. There were five vertices. So given a set of five vertices, a, b, c, d, e, I'm going to denote by chi h the indicator that there is a copy of h on these five vertices. OK, and there may be more than one. So here are five vertices. And suppose they contain these uh, four, five, six, suppose all, all seven of these edges are present. In this case, there are two copies. So here is A, B, C, D, E. Now this contains two copies of uh, 
edge. One is by taking, by ignoring the edge AC. But you can also get another copy by ignoring the, okay, so this edge also has to be present. DC has to be present. So suppose all these eight edges are present, then you can see that there's a copy of H supported by ignoring the edges AC and EC, but you can get another copy of H by ignoring the edges AB and BE. So convince yourselves that that is true. So then C takes the role of B uh, and there's a hook from C to B. Okay, so you can, there may be more than one copy present. Okay, so that's uh, um, the indicator. Or I guess I should say that the better way to say it is that there are different permutations of these uh, vertices which might give rise to different copies. Um, so if I call this pattern H, this also brings up some questions about counting, which may be interesting in themselves. So, Okay, so here is a pattern A, B, C, D, E that contains, uh, uh, this is what we are looking for, but now if you look at A, the edge A, C is present, C, E is present, E, D and D, A are present. and AE is present and CP is present. So here, uh, yeah, so then this indicator of this permutation, A, B, C, E, D, or no, A, C, B, D, E also works, okay, uh, is also one in this picture. So there may be on this same set of vertices, there may be multiple copies and we have to uh, uh, count all of them or we end up counting all of them depending on how we do the counting. So that's something we should be careful about. Uh, but don't worry about it. It looks a bit messy, but because we don't care about constants, uh, the messiness doesn't affect us. We can do the counting quite easily. But I just want to make you aware that there are uh, all these different permutations of the vertices coming up and that, that plays a role in the counting. Okay, so let me clear that. Uh, yeah, but keep just the definition. So chi H uh, A, B, C, D, B is the indicator that um, okay, so edges relevant to H are present. So edges the picture we draw was A, B, B, C, um, A, D, A, E, let me draw it here. A, B, C, D, E. A, 
B, B, C, A, D, A, E, B, E, D, E. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the right number. Are present. More edges could be present. We don't care whether they are present or not. So for instance, the edge BD may be present, but we are not counting that. Okay, so, uh, so this is one uh, labeled instance of H on the random graph GNP. And then we define NH to be the sum over all. Okay, let's now keep track of order. Ordered subsets A, B, C, D, E of chi H. Sum is over order subsets. And some of these may be counting the same thing. For instance, if we switch the labels of A and E, we are counting exactly the same object. So whether we count ordered subsets or unordered subsets, there are different ways we have to make sure we are not double counting, but let's just define this random variable this way. Uh, and then we can calculate the expectation. So the expectation of NH uh, is the expectation of the sum, which by linearity of expectation is the sum over A, B, C, D, E of the expectation of the indicator that A, B, C, D, E in this order support a copy of H. Okay, and what's the probability of this? So here these six particular edges have to be present. So the probability of that is P to the six. Other edges, we don't care whether they are present or absent. So this is the sum over all ordered quintuplex A, B, C, D, E of Pn to the six. Okay, and then how many ways are there of choosing these ordered quintuples? There are n choose five ways of choosing five subsets, subsets of five vertices. And given these five vertices, we can order them in five factorial ways. And then we have Pn to the six. Okay, and then if I do this calculation, this is approximately n to the five over five factorial times five factorial times P, Pn to the six. And that is n to the five, p to the six. Okay, so um, because I counted ordered quintuples here, the five factorial canceled out. When counting triangles, we counted them unordered because there it was obvious that no matter how you order the vertices, you are seeing the same triangle. Here, it's less obvious. You can count either way you like, but neither is the correct answer. You can, uh, so the, the correct number of uh, copies you should count is uh, neither n to the five over five factorial, nor is it n to the five. Uh, for this particular pattern, it's somewhere in between. For the triangles, it was exactly n choose three. Uh, and what it is in between depends on how many ways you can relabel the vertices of this graph and get the same graph. 
uh, and any such relabeling is called an automorphism and the number of automorphism and they form a group. And so what you have to do is you have to divide five factorial by the size of the automorphism group of H. So I, I'm not going to go into that. I just want to say that it is possible to count exactly. And the way to count exactly is to use the size in the denominator here, not five factorial, but the size of the automorphism group. Uh, but, um, Okay, firstly, it's hard to calculate uh, and we don't care about constants, so we are not going to bother with this. But if you are interested, by all means, there's a brief discussion of it in the notes. So by all means, look it up. Um, I don't know if calculating the size of the automorphism group of a graph is a hard problem in the usual computational sense. I don't know if it's NP hard, or if there's a polynomial time algorithm known for it. A related problem was open until recently. The, the so-called graph isomorphism problem was open until recently, but it's been shown in the last few years that, that is, there is a polynomial time algorithm for that. Uh, but I don't know the status of uh, computing the size of the automorphism group. Anyway, so I'm men mentioning and passing some complicated things, but don't worry about them. We don't care about them. Uh, all we care about is the approximate calculation, which tells you that the number of copies of uh, H within this random graph, the expected number of copies, scales like N to the five, B to the six, uh, up to some constants, we can't, we don't know exactly, but we don't care. Those constants don't grow with N or shrink with P. They just depend on the graph H, which is some fixed finite graph. Okay. Okay, so let me rewrite this. So we've shown that the expected number of copies of H is approximately n to the five, p to the six, and p may depend on n. Now let's do the same calculation for h prime. And let me remind you that h prime consisted of four vertices and five edges. So that's h prime. So we can similarly define chi h prime on ordered four tuples of vertices A, B, C, D as the indicator that in this particular order, they support a copy of H prime, which says that the edges A, B, B, C, C, D, D, A, a, C are all present. So these five edges are present. And there may be more present. So B, D may also be present, but we don't care. Okay, and so uh, now if we want to calculate, let's also define NH prime to be the sum over all ordered four tuples A, B, C, D of this indicator. And then the expectation of NH prime is approximately N to the four because there are n choose four ways of choosing these times four factorial ways of ordering them, which gives us n to the four. And then the expectation of this indicator, chi h prime, which takes values either zero or one. But for this indicator to be one, uh, 
all five edges have to be present, which has probability p to the five. So this is n to the four, p to the five. Okay, so we've calculated the expected number of copies of uh, uh, H and H prime in this uh, random graph. And now we are going to pick a particular value for P. And let me uh, look up what value from the notes, what value I'm picking. So the value we are going to pick is, uh, okay. Again, we take Pn to be uh, n to the minus alpha. And I'm going to pick the particular value alpha is 9 11. Okay, and let's see what happens to the expected number of copies of H and H prime in this random graph G and P. So the expected number of copies of H is n to the five or approximately n to the five, p to the six, which is n to the five minus six alpha. And the number of copies of H prime is n approximately n to the four, p to the five, which is n to the four minus five alpha. So if we take alpha is 9 11, then 5 minus 6 alpha is 5 minus 54 over 11 is 1 11, and 4 minus 5 alpha is 4 minus 45 over 11 is minus 1 11. Okay, and so what our calculations tell us is that the expected number of copies of H in the random graph G and P uh, is approximately n to the 1 11, scales as n to the 1 11. And so this goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, while the expected number of copies of h prime in this random graph scales as n to the minus 1 11th and goes to zero. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so let's see what the implications of this are. I'm going to just rewrite these things again. The expected number of copies of H prime we calculated goes to zero and the expected number of copies of H go to infinity. And H prime was the square with the diagonal. And H was the same graph with one more edge. One more vertex and one more edge was this. Okay, so this suggests if the number of expected number of copies of h in the random graph is tending to infinity, it's reasonable to expect that we should see at least one. We should in fact see lots. Okay. So this calculation tells us there are lots and lots of copies of h in the random graph g and p, 
But every time there's a copy of H, there must also be a copy of H prime. Simply ignore this vertex and edge, and there should be a copy of H prime sitting in the random graph. But the expected number of copies of H prime is going to zero. So with high probability using Markov's inequality, there is no copy of H prime in the random graph GNP, but there are lots of copies of H. What's going on? There's a paradox here. We cannot have a copy of H without also having a copy of H prime. With probability close to one, there are no copies of H prime, but the expected number of copies of H is very, very big. And this, this seems very strange. <coughs> okay, so how do we explain this paradox? I'll leave you to think about this. So I'll end this lecture here and I'd like you to think some more about this paradox before we address this in the next lecture.